have a new logo. So for those of you who know us as LiveWell Colorado, we've recently gone through a very exciting rebranding, refreshing, um, and look out in the next few weeks for our new website and some updated information about that. Um, we will be talking today, this is one of our first few kind of launch webinars. So today's is about nutrition incentives, which in Colorado right now is primarily Double Up Food Box Colorado. So I know many of you on the line are market managers, um, people who are using the program, people who know about the program. So Nourish Colorado will still continue to run Double Up Food Box and to offer that to the state of Colorado. Um, in the future, we will have a couple more webinars coming your way. So that will be Healthy Food Incentive um, about our local procurement program and um, about our healthy food policy work. So we are excited to launch today. Before we dive into the panelists, a few things. So throughout the webinar, please ask your questions in the chat and we will have 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, if you can, please direct the question if it's for one particular panelist or if it's for all panelists. So just let us know so at the end we can make sure to field those to the right individual. And then before we start, I just want to say a big thank you. So we recently put in an application for the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program Grant in order to sustain and grow our Double Up Food Box program. So these are partners who put in either in-kind or financial support to the program. And then there's many other supporting partners, markets, um, our community food advocates. So we just really appreciate all of you and the work you do to keep this program going. And then we also wanna thank the Double Up Food Bucks advisory team. So in talking about the future of nutrition incentives, this is by no way happening in a vacuum over at the Nourish Colorado team. Um, we have an active Double Up Food Bucks advisory team with these members who help inform the direction of the program and where it's going. Um, those the application for the advisory team will be live in January, February next year. So if you really love this work and you're like, wow, I want to be part of this team talking about its growth and direction and future, um, uh, please apply. And today's speakers, so we're going to have, um, I'll have the speakers introduce themselves in a moment, but we are going to have Andy Fisher, Executive Director at Ecological Farming Association, Andrea Loud, Community Food Activist and Advocate, Nufan Tazazu, Owner of Syracuse Market, Don Silmany, sorry, Don Silmany, Professor and Co-Director of Ready Car and um, Colorado State University, and Eli Zegas, Food and Agricultural Policy Director, San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association, otherwise known as SPUR. So I'm going to pass it first to Andrea to do an introduction. Go ahead, Andrea. Again, I'm Andrea Lau. I live in Villa Park neighborhood, which is West Denver. Uh, we are part of the West Denver um, uh, I guess you say the um, their planning committee where they're looking to upgrade and uh, do all that good stuff. I am someone who is passionate about healthy food because of my own health. And I live in a community where I not only just call it a food desert, but a food part-time. So, uh, I'm grateful that I was able to attend the summit uh, last year. At the time, it was Live Well, Colorado, but it's because of them that I've met so many wonderful agencies and people to uh, help me with my goal and my dream for my community. Thanks so much, Andrea. I'm going to pass it to Zufan next. Okay. Hi. My, my name is Zufan Tezazu. I am in uh, my store Syracuse Market. I'm located on 1131 Syracuse Street, Denver, Colorado, 80220. Uh, I'm sorry for the noise, I'm gonna close the door, I am at work. <laughs> so 
I've been joining the develop program like four years ago. Uh, we, me and my brother, we are happy to join with the develop program. So thank you so, so much. This is it. <laughs> All right, me? next. Yes, yes, Sivan, we can hear you. Okay. Um, next up, Dawn. Hi, I'm Dawn Thomany. I'm a professor of agricultural and resource economics at Colorado State University. And um, how I got involved with uh, Double of Food Bucks is I've always kind of focused on farms that choose to use strategies that are kind of local and direct sales. And so a lot of times, early in the years that I worked with them, they always um, felt some tension in the fact that they, we, you know, we, we wanted them to charge the prices they needed to be viable as a farm, but they always felt some amount of concern that it wasn't always uh, affordable for the full set of people in the community. So when the best SNP programs and other incentive programs popped up, it was just exciting news for us because we knew that was one of the ways to address that perception or barrier is to make those, those goods more affordable. And I was actually lucky enough to get a meat gushu maker once and he was inspiring. So it's been fun to actually gradually bring some of my economic toolbox to looking at um, some of the broader benefits from for Double Up, not just for farmers, but, but for the broader system. Great, and Eli. Good morning, everyone. My time. Good afternoon, yours. I'm calling in from California, the Bay Area, where I work for an organization called Spur, a nonprofit very similar to Nourish Colorado in the sense that we run a Double Up Food Bucks program at seven grocery stores, pretty close to San Jose, for those of you familiar with our geography. And in addition to running a Double Up program at grocery, we also very much work on policy. So our goal is to see Double Up and programs like it. We have four or five of them in California, be available at farmers markets and grocery stores statewide. So we are on a policy path to try and make that happen in addition to running the program on the ground uh, and excited to be with you and learn more about what's going on in Colorado. Wonderful, and Andy, you are up next. We are just doing a quick introduction of your name, where you're from, where you're based, um, and then why you're excited to be on this panel today. Sure, thanks for having me and my apologies for being late. I got my time zones all messed up. I'm out on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon. I, um, I'm the Executive Director of Ecological Farming Association in Santa Cruz, um, but I'm currently in Portland, like I said. I, have, um, I haven't run a SNAP incentives program. I was on the Board of Farmers Market Fund, which is the organization in, in Oregon that runs a statewide program. So I helped them write a couple uh, successful grant pro pro proposals for the Finney slash GUSNIP program, and also have reviewed GUSNIP re, um, proposals for three years. So I'm thankful to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Andy. And I've seen a couple um, notes in the chat that people are just joining. So just a reminder, please feel free to ask questions, questions throughout. Um, and we will go over those at the end. Um, go ahead and just uh, specify who you're asking your question to. And if it's for all panelists, please still let us know all panelists. All right, our first question today is for Zufan. Zufan, we would like to know what is working well for Double Up, for Double Up Food Books at your store? And then what's been challenging as a store owner? Okay, when, thank you for the question. Like when if the first time we join the develop, like when Lindsay explained to us what's going on, and we don't really, uh, is that going to work? Is that really we can uh, trust? Then after some time, is we just join and we have big change, uh, like with the sales and like like people they people like they when we tell them when we explain to them they are very interested and uh, it is 
it is uh, like when when we when we explain to the people they say is that really you're gonna give us uh without charging from my uh, snap card we'll say yes just you, got, you guys gonna get help with uh you can eat fresh fruit and vegetables instead of you buy with food stamp we can match the money for you then you can eat fresh fruit and vegetables it's hard to explain to them the first time but it is it is it is worse after they try to use the develop program so uh, first of all uh, my sales go up and uh, uh, we have a lot of new customers and the customers they are happy and not only to make like the profit stuff to gain sale in my store you just see the smile from the people when they get it for almost free they don't pay from the first time so for them it's free so especially at the end of the month when they finish their money with first time when they come with a card to buy some fruit and vegetables to have for the day meal that is make me happy more than what i make in my store so that is very nice and what is challenging is the challenging is to explain to the customer the first time was bad, not really bad but we using the handbook to write down all the numbers how much we sell how much we receive that was it was a challenge and when it is time the ipad a little bit challenge with the ipad like when his wife the card is not working and stuff sometimes we keep calling amy she's very helpful we give her her time every time <laughs> so this is uh, the challenge and the what i like is but so when you see general yeah, food uh, develop not only to the store even to the people it's very helpful i am glad to join the food bank program and my customers happy everybody's happy and my sales go up um i am in a good hand thank you very much thank you Zufan. our next question is for andrea um 2020 has been a wild year and as a community food advocate i know you guys have had to reinvent a lot of the ways you're doing outreach and engagement and we just want to hear what are the larger challenges that SNAP recipients are facing in 2020 and how do you think the double up food bucks program is helping overcome those and how is it falling short okay i'm gonna try to answer all questions i may forget a few but i hope um the double up food program especially since covid and to newcomers who are on snap has been pretty uh rewarding uh one thing uh i go into uh areas where i just don't stand at a grocery store i i may go to a place where i know where uh family families are living such as some of the hotels and um i get to share about the double up food bus program um and doing the winter month has become a challenge in a way where trying to find uh, a place um, close in this type of the areas that I go to, and even in my own personal neighborhood, you know, we, we do have a co-op, but one of the things I get feedback on is not enough quantity and uh, choices. And um, so I also, I, I, there's, it's just, we have these little places, but they may not have a variety of what's needed for families to be able to stretch uh, or make, buy food and make a meal out of it for at least a family of four. So they have to use a lot of wisdom and some of them just don't have the knowledge of how to make that little bit stretch. 
And so I found that that to be one of the greatest challenges. And like I said, some families are living, excuse me, some families are living in motels and, and, and things like that that I have been dealing with since uh, back in October. And that's their struggle is number one, finding a good place where they can make their money go for when you have uh, two adults and five kids, uh, a corner market just doesn't kind of cut the mustard for groceries for them. And so that, that becomes, they won't go there, but at the tail end of it, they may use the uh, food hub in that way just to grab a little bit to get us through to the next uh, month for our car to refill. And so I'm facing that. And like I said, I face the, the uh, part of shame with uh, getting food stamps. People are shamed. And some of these people have been working all their lives and they never received food stamps. So they find it to be somewhat humiliating. And I'm dealing with the part where it's never humiliating, whether you walk into a corner store or a supermarket. And I, I really would hope and love for the big supermarkets to get on board. So it, it will help such large families as I've been dealing with, with the food stamp. So they love the idea. I, I remember during the summer, going into um, Denver Housing Authority and, and just meeting families and passing out the um, Double Up Food Bus card. They had, one of the questions I found most often is where have y'all been all my life? And I tell them, hey, I just discovered it too, but it's here and you know, I'm gonna do my best to make sure everybody know about it. So it, it Everybody loves the ideal, but for neighborhoods such as mine, and then I can go north of federal into a place where I know a lot of um, families are living because they were due to losing their jobs and COVID and evictions and all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have, it's tough for them to get to the little corner store. And there's nothing really close to them. So I would like maybe for the current food hubs we have, and I do know of a, a young man who's trying to start a food hub in the Southwest Denver area. Maybe we can partnership better with um, producers and farmers to have a much more, uh, more, more food there and choice. Because when you go from shame and then you don't have choice. It only adds to that feeling of humiliation. But if you, I, I watch choice give people power. And I did that through my own neighborhood, even Hi. with food rescue. So those are some of the challenges, but I would never say that it, it people don't like it or people don't, um, need it um, and that it's a bad thing. It's a great thing. I think it's just education, knowledge, and more resources that are needed. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. My next question is for Don. So as many of you know, part of the Double Up program um, is that we're trying to really circulate dollars in our local agricultural economy. And so Don, what uh, challenges are growers facing in 2020? And do you see Double Up as playing a role in mitigating against those challenges or promoting growers? And if so, for whom? So three part question there. And I'm happy to repeat for any of you pieces of the questions as needed. Yeah, so it's been an interesting year for, for farmers and we weren't even sure when it first um, you know, was announced that we were gonna have some of the shutdowns that we were, what it would do. Obviously the first and most noticeable impact on some of them was for those who had gotten to the scale that they were starting to do sales to schools or restaurants and chefs, 
you know, those markets just closed down immediately. And that was probably the, the biggest shock. What so many of them have noted to us is that it was then met with kind of a wave of new interest in buying local and direct. So in some of their other markets, the farmers markets, as they gradually did get to open, their CSAs, if they had memberships open, their farm stands, they actually saw lots of renewed interest. And so um, uh, I, I think um, in some ways, some of them saw actually a stronger year in terms of sales. Now, obviously the real concerns there are, some of that came with increased cost of production. They were trying to protect their workers, which means they had to take both ha have some measures and buy some equipment they didn't have before. And because I think so many of them did really feel like ethically they wanted to make sure their workers who were deemed essential were taken care of. They, they went above and beyond making sure they were safe, which really kind of raised their cost structure. Um, uh, you know, and the other thing of course, is that farmers markets were really struggling with how to open and there was not particularly great guidance. I think I'm really amazed at how many markets did find a way to, to find it a uh, way to be open. So of course, then some of those markets were equipped with ways to support people who did bring electronic benefits and never was that a bigger win than probably for this year. Um, so I, I think um, they, 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 they're appreciative of that. Cause again, as much as the farms are worried about being viable and making enough this year, they knew that food security and people's budgets were really taking um, on some significant hardship this year. So they wanted to make sure they were part of the solution. You know, I think what is still not, a, not, not clearly known is, is two things is where still the food assistance community is going to continue to morph a little bit. You know, we saw the farm to family food box programs, lots of innovative partnerships happen where our farmers were supporting um, food pantries, feeding Colorado and so forth. And I'm not sure where that's gonna settle as this all um, normalizes a bit. But that'll matter. And then also retailers had a really good year. Um, there was record sales for retailers and that, that could be good. But again, particularly with Amazon being so strongly in the mix there, now that online delivery is gonna become a, a thing, there's a lot of concern about whether there's ever really gonna be full access for local products. And so that's why having any nudge like this where you can approach a retailer and give them an incentive to carry local and procure locally like you guys do with some, with some of what you do um, is, is gonna be a win because that's really an unknown. And so it is easier sometimes just to do the one big distributor that brings all your stuff. But we know from Coloradans that that's not what they want. And if nothing else, all the huge sales increases at some of the direct markets should be a signal of that. But it's still so relatively small a bucket of money that I think keeping the retailer's attention on this is gonna be hard. And that's what producers need to know because we don't know whether to tell them to continue even pursuing that market if the direct markets are doing so well. But it's very hard to scale up mm -hmm. and get to the size that's viable without those bigger markets. Thank you, Don. Um, I, my next question is for Andy. So as someone who has been working to improve healthy food access and strengthen resilient food systems for some time at the national level, how do you think all of this work around incentives is playing out? What barriers are incentives effectively addressing or good at solving? And what remaining issues do they not address? Sure, and no, I appreciate the question. So I think I think we need to take a look at of our context. And we've been operating in a bifurcated food system in which uh, if you're if you have the money, you have access to organic food, you have access to local food, and if you don't, it's much more problematic. Um, so SNAP incentives have been really good at bringing low-income consumers to farmers markets. They've been uh, about introducing them to that. Uh, to that experience and making it more affordable. They've been really good at providing income to farmers. You hear story after story of farmers who are able to expand their operations because of, uh, because of SNAP incentives or other coupon programs. Um, they've been key in many farmers markets uh, across the country in maintaining that, in that farmers market being able to grow and to maintain and maintain its existence as uh, sometimes we see markets in the past few years, their their sales levels have gone down. So they've been good, at, you know, and they've also been very good at, um, you know, at f the research I've, I've seen has shown that they've been good at uh, improving food security and improving the quantity of produce uh, that people are purchasing. They've been, and they've also been good at experiential nutrition education. So, you know, they've been a great tool for bridging 
the, that the, that kind of core issue of uh, lower income consumers needing low prices and small farmers needing decent income, decent price, decent prices as well for themselves to be able to um, afford the cost of uh, be able to make a profit. So that's been one of the fundamental challenges in in serving lower income consumers is that the yeah, cost yeah. price issue. I think where the where the challenges lie on a couple of things, and I know the you know the the movement doesn't have a single coherent vision on this, but there's you know there's there's issues around whether SNAP incentives are going to continue in farmers markets or they're, whether they're going to migrate to supermarkets, and whether um, a, a program that was started in the farmers market world is going to be taken over in the supermarket world, and where farmers markets are not able to compete um, with, with with the supermarkets. And I think also uh, another core issue that I've been worried about since the get go, since these programs have been started, is the sustainability. I, mean, I think we're seeing a little bit of donor fatigue, especially in Oregon. Um, and I can even, you know, at the national level as a reviewer, I saw a little bit of that. Um, in that, you know, where where does this program go? How much, how big can we make it? How will donors continue to invest money into this program, into these programs and have them grow and grow and grow? At what point does that stop? Or wh how does how does this I guess the question I'm trying to ask is is how does SNAP incentives translate into public policy um, and be integrated into the SNAP program or, you know, or, or funded on an ongoing level in a way that's more sustainable than depending upon private philanthropy? Thank you, Andy. I saw our whole group here with a lot of head nods. I think that's a really important question. I appreciate you bringing that up. Our next question is for Eli. So Eli, out in California, you run a very different Double Up Food Box program than here, ours here in Colorado. So tell us about what your program looks like and what about your approach do you wish everyone did? And what have you tried that has not turned out to be so successful? And I will moderate too. I know you're not telling us all to do it the same, but broadly, <laughs> what would you recommend to us and other states and, and what, yeah, we'll leave it there. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Amy. And I, I think, um, you know, in many ways, what we do is very similar to what uh, Double Up Colorado is doing. Same idea that we are supporting producers and consumers at the same time, matching penny for penny up to a certain amount per day when people buy eligible products. So big picture, our goals, as Andy talked about, are um, increase food security, improve health, and support local agriculture, in our case, state-grown agriculture. And I'm not sure we've we've got it figured out. Uh, you know, some of the things that we do differently uh, with our stores than I think you guys do in Colorado, um, though it's similar to your larger stores, is all our grocery stores, the, the double up bucks themselves pop out on a piece of paper in a receipt. Um, so we don't uh, we don't have a loyalty card program. It's all in we we spend a lot of time up front with the grocers to update their cash registers, their point of sale systems, so that it's as seamless as possible for the customer and and the cashier in the store itself. Uh, but it's not seamless. Uh, there's a lot of paper going back and forth, and so ultimately we want to move away from the paper. And we envision a, a day, and we're working towards this in California right now, where someone, uh, a Snap customer, earns their double up food bucks. Uh, by swiping their EBT card and purchasing local produce, and then the money just goes back on their card. And this is what was done in Massachusetts uh, in a big pilot. It's what's happening at Massachusetts farmers markets right now. Um, no need to have a second loyalty card, like a double up card, or no need to carry a paper coupon or a wooden token. That would make it easier for the customer, it would make it easier for the store, and it would definitely make it easier for the people administering the program just like the move from paper food stamps to an EBT card, it's moving from paper or tokens to electronic. So a lot of advantages there. Uh, we worked with some other groups in California to uh, follow in Massachusetts footsteps. So right now, California is implementing an EBT integration pilot, which is moving slow, but we hope to know more about soon. And I'll, t I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and then I'd say our other goal policy-wise is exactly what Andy hit on. I think I share Andy's fear that these programs are not sustainable long-term if they're always going to be grant funded or there will be limits to, to who can successfully do it. So we, our focus at, at SPUR is Bay Area and California um, and we see a future and we want a future in which we're not running this program anymore, but the state is. So that, that double up and programs like it, healthy food incentives become a permanent supplement to SNAP in California funded by the state. I would love for the federal government to fund it. So 
that's another route. So that SNAP, all told, uh, has a supplement, the Supplemental Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, where they build in bonus dollars um, nationally. We don't do a lot of policy advocacy in DC. There are other groups, I think, better positioned to push for that. But that I'd love to see that, and I think that would be more doable for other states. Uh, California, we grow a lot of produce, so the politics here are different um, and make it more feasible. But absolutely, if if we know the program works and it helps people, as, as Andrea and Zufan have been talking about, then we should make it a supplement to SNAP. Um, and we should find the money to do it, especially at this time. Um, it's a good investment. There's research that shows it is. Uh, so let's not wait anymore and let's make this a permanent supplement to SNAP. Thank you, Eli. I appreciate the strong look to the future and also see many head nods on this call. Um, for our next panel question, um, I'm gonna ask the same question to all of you. And then when you're done speaking, just go ahead and pass it to another panelist. So our next question, you can leave us with thoughts on any pieces of these. So um, we would love to hear what you see on the horizon for nutrition incentives. Um, what is coming that might look different than today? and or what's your ideal vision um, or state of the program? And what would you like Double Up Food Bucks to look like in your world in 2025? And we will start with Eli. <laughs> so uh, I, I maybe like scooped myself here by talking so much about the future. I just get so excited about it. Um, but what I imagine is that we, right now there are about five different programs in California. They all have slightly different program designs. And so I saw someone sent us a question about this in San Diego. So there's another program in San Diego called Mas Fresco More Fresh. It's an excellent program and it runs with a, a store called Northgate Gonzalez. Um, we do it with uh, three different gross, small grocery family owned chains in the San Jose area. The future looks like you enroll in SNAP. You are getting your benefits, you've got your EBT card. You go to nearly any grocery store. You don't even have to look at a map to know if they offer double up or a program like it. Let's just call it bonus bucks. And, and uh, you walk into that store, depending on what state you're in, either they're doing what we do, which is we label on the shelves what's California grown. So uh, because we grow so much all year long in California, you're encouraging the customer to understand what's seasonal. They see what's California grown. They know they're gonna get bonus dollars on that. They go to the cash register. Maybe they were paying attention to bonus bucks, maybe they weren't. Either which way, they get them. And they get a receipt. At the end of their transaction, they've paid with their EBT card. And the receipt says, you earned $12.32 of bonus bucks today. Now you can spend that money on anything SNAP eligible, any food when you come back to the store. We've rebated it on your card, you don't have to do anything. The store, meanwhile, also doesn't have to submit any paperwork to SPUR or to the state, just like they get paid back for SNAP by the state or the federal government the state or the federal government is paying them back for the, the, the extra bonus dollars, just like they get paid back for SNAP. And what we see as a result is more purchasing power. So to Andrea's point, there are a number of things to address, education, knowledge, and more resources. Uh, I think programs like Double Up primarily address the resources. They don't get to the education and knowledge that needs to be happening in other ways. And I know Nourish Colorado does that and, and other groups do that. This really only gets at affordability. So what we see is people have more money in their pockets for food. It's primarily because they're buying fruits and vegetables. So hopefully people's nutrition is improving. And to Andy's point, there are studies that indicate that people's dietary behavior improves and hopefully that has good health outcomes, which we've seen also studied. So people have more money in their pockets. They're buying more fruits and vegetables. They're eating more fruits and vegetables. Hunger goes down, health goes up and there's more revenue going to farmers. And we fund this all, uh, could be a variety of different ways. So right now it's funded by a farm bill, which is general tax dollars from the US government. We could fund it with a national or a state soda tax or a candy tax. We could close some corporate loopholes at the state or federal level and fund it that way. But we've decided as a society that we don't think people should go hungry. And we have a very administratively efficient way to deliver money in people's pockets. And I should say, we could also just increase SNAP, period just increase the amount of money on SNAP and add this on top. I, I don't think those are exclusive of each other. We know SNAP is not adequate for what people need. So increase benefits level at the base minimum and then add this as another layer on top of it to encourage healthier eating. Both of those would be fantastic. And that's the future I'm hoping for. And I would definitely like to see that at least in California, if not beyond by 2025. 
Great. Well, next we're going to pass it to Dawn. Same question. Wow, Eli is hard to follow, but um, and that's a great vision. You know, I think that the one thing at least that got already put into the question box you didn't address is we know online food purchasing just went over a, a, a threshold of all of a sudden people got used to it. It was it was slow in coming. This year just changed everything. And, you know, of course, there were some accommodations made to make it possible to use electronic benefits, but only with the biggest players. So I think that's one new question mark that's been thrown into the mix is how, how, how much U.S. households are going to sustain buying mm -hmm. online. And if we can also find the flexibility to make that online electronic benefits um, um, activity work for all types of markets, um, big and small and direct and traditional. So I think that's going to be one other question mark in there. But, you know, I, I agree with Eli that almost every, every piece of research we see shows just getting folks more dollars through these programs is the most efficient way to let them get access to the food they need. Um, the one thing he didn't mention, and we have lots of conversations about this, is ec the Economic Research Service out of USDA has been able to do a study on, on normal SNAP. And there we do see a lot of substitution effect, we call it, where the dollars that are given, a lot of it does get spent on food and, and improving the diet of the household, but it also frees up some money for them to spend on other goods. This is kind of like a little hypothesis I have in my head, but um, two things, in direct markets, we don't have an evaluation of that because the U.S. has not done that. But because there's be, because of, of the nature of those markets and there being less alternative things to buy, perhaps that substitution effect doesn't happen quite as strongly in all markets. So um, at least when I've worked our winter markets and volunteered there, we see people using most of those additional dollars and in fact spending more than they intended to spend that day. But you could imagine it playing out differently in like a Walmart because how many things that store offers and all the alternatives you could have, for instance. So what would be really interesting to see is, is, is if that substitution effect is the same for a double up program as it is for normal SNAP. And if we do see a bigger bump in dietary quality because these incentives are targeted to one part of the, the um, um, food budget that they have. That, that's something really curious for us. But again, our, our belief would be the more ubiquitous you make it that it's available everywhere in all the markets and doesn't have these, the, they're, they're not barriers, but this extra set of steps to actually implement to do it, get it. it, it it's got to generally help um, increase the effectiveness or impact of the program that it's actually getting to the people who need it to do what they want to do with it and trickling into the um, different parts of the food economy that can benefit from it as well. Wonderful. Next, I'm going to pass that over to Zufan. So Zufan, in 2025, what would you like Double Up Food Bucks to look like? Um, thank you. For 2025, like, I hope the developers continue like this more grow, like, uh, in my store, um, like mm, not for this year, I wish uh, I can extend more, uh, like for the groceries. I wish I'm gonna have like more people they can uh, serve us with more produces because we go every store to collect the produces. Uh, and like for people, for the, like my, my sellers is going to be improved, of course, and for the people, uh, instead of they spend with their food stamp money, that's extra money, they can have extra uh, food on the table, like if people, they don't, they don't afford to buy fruit and vegetables, you know, like healthy food, they can eat, uh, they can, um, yeah. I don't know how to explain. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and so for You're the doing next great. Fine. <laughs> sorry, I have broken English. English is my second language, so it's hard to explain sometimes. I'm so sorry, but uh, working hard to change my like instead of uh, I am on rent now, I can have my own building. I can extend more fruit and vegetables grocery store more groceries for them to serve my neighborhood, my people uh, to, grow, to grow up fast. 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Zayfan, for sharing your vision. Next, we're gonna go to Andrea. Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I love everything everybody said. Eli, you had my head bouncing. And, um, and so did you, Andy. But for me, what I want 2025 to look like is a, I'm going to call it independence. I want to see a double up food, but go towards people learning how to grow their own leafy green vegetables, how they can start it on a patio, how we can join forces with co a community. I have um, the opportunity to manage a community garden that is privately owned. I believe that agencies such or uh, organizations such as uh, Marriage Colorado, double up food bucks would be great if it if we had the opportunity to purchase the plant edible plants or seeds and use gardening for neighborhoods such as use gardens for neighborhoods such as mine, and that will put fresh produce in there. That will take away um, some of the issues with uh, trying to get food delivered. And then I, 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 I'm an online shopper. However, I have residents who are not tech savvy. They do good to just have a cell phone. And so when you live in an area, you're able to see from the inside. And I would like this for my 20, 25 visions of that double up food bus is to say, hey, we're not only going to keep these other things we have going with the grocery stores, the corner stores, um, that, but we're going to help people learn how to grow their own tomatoes, their own vegetables. And then we're not going to just tell them to grow it, but some people may like squash, but don't have no idea what to do with it show them the different things that they could do with different produce, how they, that uh, four squash can feed a family of seven. And so that's my vision of Double Up Food, but like working with park and recreation uh, to maybe donate seeds for uh, park and recreation to start that type of community garden or the Denver Urban Garden, but where it's right in the heart of neighborhoods such as mine and make it be, I guess I dream big, but I, I, I can see mobile, um, more mobile uh, farmers market where it actually comes into the neighborhood like, like uh, mine, which would be so helpful. You know, maybe once everything gets settled down, we can go up to the, um, that uh, motel where I know homeless people are living and we could take this fresh produce and give them opportunity to have their choice, give them opportunity to eat well. And I believe I, I'm gonna go back to that choice or growing your own food. It, 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 it empowers people. It, it, it's so much power to say, I did it. It's so much power to say, I chose this, I didn't have to take that. And I just feel that the opportunities are there. I, 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 um, I like, I, I appreciate quick fixes, but I like security. And I believe my whole heart, and I will always believe one way to have that food security is through the gardening part of life. And if we can not only give a fish, but teach people how to fish and use double up food bucks to purchase those seeds and those uh, little uh, starter plants, I believe that we will be doing community, society, and America a great help. I, I, 
that's my heart, and that's where it lies. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And then Andy, I will pass it to you. Sure, so the nice thing about going last is you get to hear everybody, but the bad thing about going last is everybody takes all your ideas. So I appreciate what, you know, Eli and Andrea, what you guys are saying. I, I just wanna bring, I, I think I wanna bring up three points. Um, and the first one is, I'm, I'm talking about the Gusnet program, which is a 40 million, 40-ish million dollar, $50 million program that funds a lot of these uh, SNAP incentives around the country. And it's a competitive grants program right now. Um, I did some analysis on where the money went um, from 2015 to 2019. I found that about $15 and 31 cents went to, to, into every, every person who received SNAP got $15 and 31 cents in, in federal money. Uh, California got $6 and 33 cents per person and, and for every SNAP recipient and Texas only got 16 cents. So there's, there's this huge inequity between states that don't have the capacity uh, of good grant writers, of, capa of capable organizations like Eli's or Nourish Colorado's or, or other, other groups that are able to capture that money and able to raise the dollar for dollar match. Um, especially in the South, um, there's just a lot of problems with nonprofit capacity and able to, 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 to manage those, uh, to be able to compete effectively. So I think what we need is, is different, if we're gonna keep that program as as a competitive grants program, and there needs to be structures in place that, that build that equity, that build that capacity into it. Ideally, I don't know if it's in the next farm bill, the farm bill after that, you know, I'd really like to see um, that program become better integrated into the SNAP program so that everybody in the country has access to it, not just a small, small, small selection, and that they have access to it on a year round basis. Um, it becomes a core part of the SNAP program and where that money comes from, if we increase the SNAP program, it's, it's woefully underfunded as it is current, as it is right now. Um, the third piece is probably a little bit more pie in the sky, but I think we need to think a little bit bigger and we need to think about how can we use the SNAP program, how can we use this, the double up program as a model for changing the SNAP program, for, for reforming it into an effort that drives broader change in the local and regional food system that, that, that supports those efforts and puts priorities to those and puts priority to those efforts as well as uh, makes produce more affordable uh, for folks who can't afford it. So right now we have a situation in which uh, highly processed foods tend to be more affordable calorie, calorie per calorie than say produce than broccoli or apples. Um, we, that's, that's backwards and that's driving uh, health inequities, health disparities in our country. So we need to think about how do we use, those, how do we use that $80 billion of the SNAP program to drive change um, towards the more healthful behaviors and so that the easy choice, so the right choice is the easy choice. Thank you, Andy. Now I'm gonna start pulling up questions from the audience. We likely won't have time to get to all of them but I'll make sure that the panelists see particular questions um, and all of your wonderful comments as well, even after this webinar. So our first question is directed primarily at Andy, but is really for everyone. Um, do you think that Amazon having double up food box would be a positive or negative change? They've recently started accepting SNAP. So would it be helpful for local farmers or harmful? I don't know if it'd be helpful for local farmers or harmful. I don't. Um, I'm not a big fan of more subsidies for a company like Amazon. They don't need more federal dollars to subsidize sales there. They have plenty through, um, through lots of different avenues, um, whether it's local or federal. So I, I, would, I don't see that as a positive. Can I offer something, Amy? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it depends on um, you know, how you define what, what is the benefit. So if it's to local farmers, I agree with Andy. I don't think there are too many local farmers who are selling through Amazon's supply chain. They buy big um, and, and they're not focused on sourcing local. So to the extent that someone gets into that supply chain, great, but I think the chances are little. But if, if we look at it as, is there benefit to low-income SNAP customers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, right now there are not many delivery options. If you wanted to get um, food delivered to your home and pay with SNAP, Hopefully USDA will bring more stores on, but Walmart and Amazon are the, are the big players right now. And that's helpful. So I, I think 
if we think about it as limited resources, like who are the retailers we want to partner with first? I'm not sure Amazon makes the most sense. I don't think um, it, it's necessarily the right partner to begin with. But in a in the sense of Amazon and its product mix is now available to low income customers to, for delivery. I don't think that's a bad thing overall. I don't think it's a huge win for local farmers, but I think that's a nice option for people to have if they want it. So I think it's, it's, it's not a straightforward question and, and there are many things that Double Up provides. So it is both for producer and consumer and some options benefit the consumer quite a bit, but not much the producer. And then other ways you can structure the program or deliver it really benefit the producer with limited help to the consumer. So I think it gets complicated whenever there's a new proposal. Yeah, and I was curious if Don had any thoughts on this question. Well, I, I kind of answered it in my original answer that I think it's gonna be political. There's gonna be a lot of um, discussion about it, but you know, it gets down to really what this administration's philosophy is gonna be about. Um, um, expediency and efficiency, which is always going to be the winning out to the bigger players who can implement this stuff easy to versus whether they're going to do the careful, thoughtful things that are, you know, as economists can make pretty good arguments about where there's going to be the, the better impact to communities and that that's going to tend to go with it um, trickling down to being available for the widest swath of, of, of markets. But, um, you know, sometimes they ask us and listen and sometimes they don't. But you know, there's definitely some role we can play in helping to frame that story. Thank you. And our next question, I'm going to take this one, but please, panelists, chime in. So someone asked what has been the impact of Purdue's food box program on Double Up Colorado? Um, I'd be curious if it's maybe different in some place like California. Um, but what I will say is we have not seen diminished participation since Purdue's food box. And if anything, 2020, the demand for the SAP program, but along with that, the demand for Double Up Food Bus um, has increased. And that's been across the retail chain. So that goes from you know our CSA direct farm level up until the supermarket. But I know many farmers markets saw an increased demand for both SAP and Double Up this year. Um, and then our next question, and we're just gonna do one more because I wanna make sure people have the information to follow up with us. Um, but the first question is, if, um, can pandemic EBT be used for Double Up Food Bucks? So I can answer that. Yes, it can. Um, but then, um, particularly for Andrea, do you have ideas to promote the use of pandemic EBT um, for Double Up Food Bucks? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Um, so pandemic EBT, the dollars that families are getting from not having school lunch, um, mm -hmm. Somebody wondered what ideas do you have to promote the use of Double Up Food Box that this program is available to the families who are receiving PEBT benefits? My uh, first go to is going to be fine. I, I, and I've been thinking about this ever since I met the families over in the um, White Rock Motel. I have, I, my head was like, how do I get cooking matters to come and to show these people how to, to use it? And then my challenges of great with that was communication. I, I have some people who only speak Spanish and I, it, even though the card has Spanish speaking on there, but then I was met with a Vietnamese family. So, you know, I just kind of got done right there, but I just, I'm going to go right back to communication. Like, I can't tell you how deep I went into the Denver Housing Authority, and no one ever heard of it. No one ever thought about fresh produce, but everybody's saying they want to eat healthy. And I, my thing is just showing family how you can get other protein. You don't have to buy meat all the time. How our plants that we grow has protein. So I'm, I'm going to say if, how do I, I, other than the word empowerment, will somebody have that knowledge of how to do better, they will do better. And that's, that's what I'm going to say. So if you can get that out there to the family, 
And trust me, I was on that uh, thing with the uh, in Hunger, Colorado, when the EBT, the extra came out. And I went on a crusade trying to help families know it's out here. You use it. And yes, you can use it with this with the Double Up Food Bus program. And they, they're looking for it because when you don't have money coming in, are you living off of unemployment of a family of seven? That almost calls for a magic to make things work. So mm -hmm. I believe that um, if you can just get that knowledge out there, push that, give ideas. I believe that Double Up Food Buck can take not from just getting it from our schools, our kids are getting lunches from school. Now they're mostly, they're at home right now, but it can stay at home. It'll spread abroad. Mm -hmm. thank All right, thank you, Andrea. So we're at one o'clock, so I need to wrap us up, but thank you so much to all of the panelists. I'm gonna share a slide really quick with ways people can continually be involved in this conversation and in this work um, with us. So. Like I said, we will have our advisory team um, application out early next year. If you're already on the advisory team, you're welcome to stick around, but we do have some open spots. Um, I also want to point out a lot of questions showed up about just the logistical how Double Up Food Bucks works in Colorado. You're welcome to email me or go to doubleupcolorado.org. We've got how it works videos. We've got an FAQ. If you want to find resources to spread the word, I would email Karan at Nourish Colorado. Um, we will give you flyers, posters, whatever you need to get this word out in your community. And then if you wanna join our mailing list for um, future webinars, we do, like I said, have two more coming up as we launch Nourish Colorado. So just go ahead um, and sign up for a take action email. So I will stay on for a little bit. Um, big clap for our panelists. I think you all did such a wonderful job and I'm just always inspired by the five of you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you.